Switching things up a little bit for the next few videos, and we're going to talk about other countries outside of Ukraine that aren't getting a lot of attention. Largely, well, none of them are at war, so <laughs> that's a pretty good reason not to talk about them. But there are several different things in the aviation world happening that, uh, well, I find interesting, and I kind of just want to talk about. So today we'll be talking about the competition for India's next carrier-based jet fighter. I honestly just want to talk about this. <laughs> it does have some importance that I'll talk about a little later on, but generally speaking, this is purely just, I think it's neat. It's a cool face-off between the Hornet and the Rafale. Both are very interesting aircraft in their own right, uh, but just there's not a lot of talk going around, and it's still actively happening, so I figured, well, why not? This is pretty good timing. No one's talking about it, so <laughs> I'm talking about it. What am I going to talk about, though? In order, the competitors themselves, so like kind of like a brief comparison, and then we'll take a good like five or six slide stretch of the Dassault Rafale, then we'll do the same for the Super Hornet, we'll take a look at the ship they're going to be operating from, the uh, INS Vikrant, I think is the pronunciation, I could be wrong, but we'll, we'll look at it in a minute, we'll look at their existing fleet of MiG-29Ks, the naval version of the MiG-29, they're testing for a naval Tejas that I think may have ended. I've seen kind of some conflicting reports there. Um, we'll talk about why it matters, credits, and some options for the next videos or kind of the order I'm doing my next set of videos in. So be sure to stay tuned if you're curious as to what I'll be doing in the future. The main two competitors. So we've got the Dassault Rafale. The Indian Air Force already operates 36 of these. Now it is the... Air Force variant. There are three different variants, one of them being the naval version, uh, but the airframe, largely speaking, is kind of the same across the board. It's very similar to, like, the difference between the F-35A and C. Well, there are some differences that are largely speaking the same, or the F-18EF to the F-18G. It's more of just a loadout difference and a couple of tweaks to the airframe. Uh, so largely speaking, they're very similar in terms of parts compatibility. So the existing support structures within India supporting those existing Air Force Rafals could be expanded to uh, support the naval versions here with the uh, M, which is Marine. They also, the Assault Rafal, since they have those 36 in operation, won the M MRCA. This was the last fighter jet competition they had. There was a little bit of a, uh, I don't want to say full, eh, kind of a scandal, um, that didn't dissuade DeSalt from coming back in to put this here. But, you know, anytime one of these really big, complex uh, procurement programs starts happening, it's going to get a little dicey. It just got extra dicey with uh, the Indians on that particular one. And they would have interoperability with the French Navy. They've used French stuff in the past. They're using Rafales now. India's had a little bit closer relationship to France than it has most of the other kind of NATO, non-NATO allies. So this is something that may play a bigger part in the calculus for the Dassault Rafale. Uh, now, that being said, a lot of the same stuff from a naval interoperability standpoint can be said about the Super Hornet, but with the U.S. Navy. As nice as it is to be able to work with the French Navy, the Charles de Gaulle does not hang out in the Indian Ocean most of the time. However, the U.S. Navy usually has a strike group not too far away, usually either kind of around Japan or the Sea of Japan or the South China Sea region, um, kind of the Eastern Pacific from our standpoint. So that interoperability is a huge deal as well. There's a lot of existing training there. Now, of course, you don't have to really worry about that as much with the Rafals, but the training base exists. So you have a lot of experience with the U.S. Navy using these off their carriers, which are a little different than the Indian Care. We'll talk about that in a minute. But generally speaking, the training isn't going to be a problem for the most part either. Probably the biggest thing for the Super Hornet, though, uh, from India's standpoint, is the estimated 3.6 billion USD it's going to add to the Indian economy over 10 years to build out the support structures for the Hornet. Yes, I know technically the government themselves, or, large, or the Navy through via the government, is going to be buying this and having to pay for it, 
But generally speaking, from India's standpoint, they view it more as, oh, this is jobs. This is more to our GDP, which isn't like it's not going to be a huge deal of GDP, but it's more going into their economy. And that's something they view as more of a positive than a lot of other countries do. Um, just because, you know, they're growing at a very rapid rate and have been for a while now. So the more jobs for them is the better versus having to pay that from, you know, any kind of government coffers or expanding the naval budget. They just see jobs in $3.6 billion. They're like, hey, this is a really good deal. And, you know, they already have a weird, like, cupboard of strange aircraft. You know, they, they're one of the few countries out there that actively utilizes, to an extent, even some newer Russian aircraft, as well as, like, French. Uh, they've used British aircraft in the past. They've, they've got a very interesting mix of uh, avi aviation history. But what about the actual technical specs of the Dassault Rafale? Because we did talk about it in part two of our video of uh, kind of the F-16 versus the world in Ukraine's perspective. But I did want to add a couple of things. So it is not necessarily a light fighter by any means. about 23,000 pounds. It's a pretty chunky guy. It's uh, not the heaviest by any means. It's not an F-15, but it's still out here being pretty large. Um, part of that, kind of its design, part of it is some of the naval equipment also changes that a bit. His gross weight goes up a little bit more. Its max takeoff weight is just under, actually, double as empty weight. So it's not quite going to be the same ratio we see with something like the uh, Super Hornet. But it's also going to have the capability to go a lot faster. Um, so, it, well, I say that. It's mock, it's... Top speed is Mach 1.8, which is actually pretty much the exact same that we're getting with the Super Hornet. However, it can super cruise at Mach 1.4, 1, Mach 1. something the Super Hornet cannot do. So this is a pretty big deal. Um, it's not necessarily the biggest deal breaker, but generally speaking, it is nice to have the super cruise capability, which is why like all kind of fifth gen jets have been focused on we have super crews for at least some of our more advanced fighters like the F-22. And like more your more modern cutting edge fighters have this capability. Combat range is just under that of 1,200 miles with three tanks on a center line and two under the wings. This is pretty similar to the Super Hornet in terms of range. So this isn't really going to be a range fight. Most of these outside of the Super Cruise aren't going to be a very huge difference um, from a spec spec specification standpoint. Sorry. Service ceiling is just over 51,000 feet. It's actually just under 52,000 feet. Service life is anywhere from 8 to 10,000 hours, depending on which variant and which kind of lot or block or whatever you want to call it. Um, cost per flight hour. <laughs> I've not found a consistent number. But it is pretty expensive, anywhere from eighteen to twenty thousand dollars an hour. Once again, these figures can wild, can vary wildly. Um, like the U.S. DoD for most U.S. aircraft gives a very bare minimum price because a lot of the extra stuff that goes into a lot of the consumables, a lot of the salaries, a lot of the man hours are charged differently in different countries. So they kind of leave that up. It's almost like a kind of sticker price for a car without adding any of the extras. This, I think, factors some of that in, but I'm not 100% sure. And with it being kind of heralded as this really advanced, like one of the most cutting-edge fighters in the world, that makes a lot of sense to me. Swing loading is about 67 pounds per square foot. Its thrust-to-weight ratio is just under that of one, so it's actually pretty good. The Thales RBE-2 AAE AESA radar has a range of about 80 miles. I've seen some variation on that as well. Um, but generally speaking, that's kind of the average middle ground you're going to see. And then you have two Senecma M88 4E turbofan engines with about 11,250 pounds each of dry thrust. But with the afterburner, you get 17,000 pounds of thrust per engine. Pretty, pretty solid looking thing here. So what are some of the pros? Well, outside of the specifications we just talked about, the Thales Spectra Electronic Warfare System is heralded as kind of one of the most advanced systems on the face of the planet right now. 
Uh, we'll talk about it more in a moment, but this is going to give the Rafal kind of the most complete situational awareness picture that any aircraft by itself can give. Now, of course, you have AWACS and other supporting things, you know, pouring in data, data link, things like that. But generally speaking, on its own, this aircraft can sense pretty much any incoming danger from any direction, for the most part. We'll talk about it more in a moment. You also have the Thales Sagam OSF, which is, that's some French words there. It's the uh, electro-optical sensor on the front of the aircraft. It's a kind of dual camera system. You have the IRST track and search thing, and then you have a second camera, which is more for long-range identification and things like that. Then you have digital displays. We'll take a look at the cockpit and controls. Then we'll discuss what omni-roll versus what multi-roll means, because... The Rafal is the only aircraft, to my knowledge, right now that says it's Omni Roll. It's everything. It replaces like seven different aircraft, um, most of them being support aircraft. But we'll talk about that more in a moment. So, what is the Thales Spectra Electronic Warfare System, and why is it like this whole big thing? You know, well, there's a lot of it. It, it is a defense system, effectively. It's it's about information gathering and countermeasure control. So. As you kind of go around here, I wanted to make this as big as I could, so hopefully if you're full screening this on your computer, you'll be able to see. If you're on your phone, I'm not sure how well this is going to turn out, so my apologies. But kind of going around, you'll see things like chaff dispensers, different sensors for either laser or radar. Um, you have actual multiple chaff uh, dispensers as well. You have different antenna arrays. Then you have some subsystems to control all of that information. Because as nice as it is to have full situational awareness, or as, at least as most as you can, from a sensor standpoint, that's a lot of information to take in. And while the Rafal does have a two-seat variant, where you could have, you know, a, not necessarily a weapons officer in that instance, maybe a weapons officer, but someone else to kind of help digest a lot of the information, it can overload a single pilot. And this system not only takes that information in, but tries to digest it as much as possible. So you're not really overloading your main pilot. You are providing them all the relevant information without do going overboard. And that's why this has kind of been this whole big deal. But since it relies so much on actual physical sensors um, and is pretty much just proprietary to the Rafal at the moment, uh, it's not something that's being shopped around to other aircraft. This has been used um, in combat missions. The Rafal has been used in several different operations, whether it's in the Middle East or in Africa. This is done strikes around the world, and to my knowledge, I could be wrong, they haven't lost any aircraft in combat. They've had some accidents and stuff, but generally speaking, to my knowledge, this aircraft has not been shot down. That being said, it's important to like look at the fact that this also hasn't gone up against any kind of near peer enemy at any point. So, at least from ground munitions and things like that, it's 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 been working very well so far. So what is the SAGOM or the Thale SAGOM OSF? This is the IRST thing. This is the optical, uh, electro-optical camera. So you have multi-target multi passive IR. This is on the front of the aircraft. I'll try to point it out in a minute when we get a fuller view. But it's just kind of behind the radar on the nose cone right in front of the cockpit. Uh, it is pretty much automatic. It's got a wide field of view. It's got long range. They don't specify what that range is. Uh, but this is largely meant to be, and we'll see this again on the Super Hornet, but with a separate pod, the counter to stealth. This is kind of what is heralded as the stealth killer, right? No idea if it actually works very well, but this is something that the Russians and the Chinese, kind of by extension, um, but not really on most other more modern aircraft, have been using for a long time. More for a short to mid-range combat, but this is designed to kind of cut that edge out of stealth, so to be a combatant against the Su-57 or the J-20 or the J-35. 
Then you have the combat identification camera thingy next to it. Uh, Multi-mission, so this can be switched between air and ground targets, which is actually pretty useful, especially for an Omni-Roll fighter like the Rafal. has a long-range visual identification uh, capability. They, once again, don't give a specific range. Um, and it can probably wild uh, very wildly depending on what you're looking at. If it's, you know, like a pickup truck versus like a jet fighter, it's going to obviously be able to tell the jet fighter apart a little bit easier. It's more of a distinct silhouette. It's larger. It's in the air kind of against not a lot of stuff, whereas a truck on the ground is going to be a little different. However, for close air support or ground attack, this is pretty vital. It has 3D tracking and localization of uh, air-to-ground targets, or air-slash-ground targets, air-and-ground targets. Uh, once again, very important. This is something that doesn't really give a depth of field to the camera itself, but it does give a better understanding when trying to provide that information to the pilot of what they're looking at. Then you have air-to-air -air missile and gun firing capability, so this is going to kind of help adjust anytime you need to use the gun or kind of your short-range air-to-air -air missiles. You can use it for long-range, but generally speaking, if you're looking like, you know, 60 to 90 miles out, you're probably going to want to more focus on, like, a active radar missile than you are something like this. Now, it may help kind of confirm a kill or something, but generally, you're really not going to stay to guide that missile in. You're probably going to turn cold and try to get out of there, uh, in which the camera is not facing the target. Then we have the cockpit. Very modern-looking cockpit. This is something, if you're familiar with a lot of modern aircraft, isn't going to be too surprising. You don't have the centerline controls. You have both the sticks on either side. You have some of your smaller digital displays, and you have your kind of three main big ones. They are separated. They do have multifunction, or they're multimodal, depending on what phrasing you want to use there. And you still have some more analog controls there, but generally speaking, everything's going to be done on a digital display now. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, it's very modern. I do kind of like the separate panels as opposed to like one big one like we'll see in a moment with the Super Hornet. But, you know, the digital panels are something I don't think they're a bad thing. And I think we're at the point that it's probably not too big of an issue. But I do think that uh, it might be nice to have some of those, like your compass not being digital, I think would be kind of a beneficial thing. But regardless, it doesn't matter all that much. Uh, they're kind of the mo some of the most advanced displays currently out there right now. Then Omni-Roll versus Multi-Roll. I'll try not to dather on too long about this because I don't know if this image is hurting anyone's eyes. Uh, this is the first time I've actually included a GIF now that I think about it in one of my slideshows. Anyway, Omni-Roll versus Multi-Roll. So the whole point of Omni-Roll is that the Rafal does pretty much everything. It can almost operate without support aircraft, save like a tanker, possibly. Um, it has that uh, Spectra system, so it has localized kind of AWACS, right? It, it has the ability to determine threats in pretty much every possible way, not only from a radar perspective, but also your uh, laser perspective. So things like man pads or some of the larger um, ground-based kind of short to mid-range SAM systems. It gives you a better situational awareness than a lot of other aircraft. And I, now my head's starting to hurt, so I'm going to turn away from that, but still talk about Omni-Roll versus um, Multi-Roll. So generally speaking, these three different variants of the Rafal are meant to replace pretty much anything and operate on their own without AWAC support, without kind of data link. Well, it's super useful. If an aircraft gets isolated, it can pretty much handle the job. And as that spinning image showed, typically, instead of being a multi-role aircraft that's dedicated to one role or is kind of going to do one role at a time for the most part, the Omni-Roll cap capability that the Rafal boasts tries to push it in the realm that you can take off with bombs, long-range, medium-range missiles all at once, go do your anti-air mission or your bombing run, and then do the other and then come home. This is something you can technically do with multi-roll, but generally speaking, any of your air-to-air -air missiles you're going to have are usually shorter-range self-defense missiles versus 
hey, I'm going to go do an air superiority mission with a couple of tons of bombs on me, right? Um, it, it, it's not something that's typically done. Usually speaking, a lot of your heavier ground attack munitions don't help the uh, kinematic profile of an aircraft. You're not going to be able to maneuver nearly as well. You're going to be heavier. But the Rafal does what it can to try to mitigate some of those factors. Once again, this is largely a systems thing versus a specific role thing. But once again, you're really still not going to want to operate one of these without AWACS support or data link of any other aircraft around. It has the capability to do pretty much everything a multi-role fighter can. It's not necessarily purely a buzzword, but it does provide some capability, just not as much as I think a lot of people want to give it. So what about some previous export deals? So, oddly enough, the Rafal is actually pretty popular globally. Croatia has about 24 of these on order. Egypt has 54, with at least 24 being delivered as of the recording of this video. Greece has 24 on order, with the first delivery taking place July of 2021, so they probably have a few, but I'm not sure that any of their forces are like fully combat capable yet. Um, India's got 36 in service, which are their Air Force ones we talked about in, uh, earlier. Indonesia has 42 on order. Qatar has 36 on order with 27 being delivered. So their order is almost filled. And then the United Arab Emirates has 80 on order. So this is pretty prolific around the world. This is kind of the, you know, picking up the legacy of the Mirage. The Mirage was, Mirages were used pretty much across all their variants around the world. The Rafal is kind of being done the same. Now you'll note that... <laughs> With kind of the exception of, I guess, technically Greece and Croatia, none of those are European countries. This is something that, in a more businessy sense, is a way for France to do some power projection. Um, this is kind of allowing them to build different relationships, and a lot of these countries have ordered uh, aircraft from France and from Dassault before, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, but it is something to note that they still have a lot of these relationships and are still actively producing these in really large numbers. Um, it's something that you don't really see. Like, this may not be the F-35, but it probably has a good leg up on most every other modern aircraft, especially of its era, of its generation, of its age um, around the world. So pretty crazy to see all of these out there um, and with so many orders currently active at the moment. Then we have the FA-18 Eeyore F Super Hornet. Uh, its gross weight is <laughs> about 10,000 pounds heavier than that of the Rafal, and that's something we'll talk about more in a moment because it is pretty important when we look at the ship itself. Its max takeoff weight is just above double its empty weight. It has a max speed of Mach 1.8+. plus. It may be able to go a little bit faster depending on which version you're looking at. Um, which block is, is going to make a bit, little bit of a difference, not a huge one. Um, but from my research, from my understanding, even the Block 3 at this point does not have super cruise capability. Uh, the Block 3 does have some improved engine capability, but it's not something that I'm aware of that has super cruise at the moment. Its minimum combat range, effectively, from what I've found and what I've tried to deduce from like Block 2 to Block 3, it's about 550 miles, but once you start adding like conformal fuel tanks or external fuel tanks, that goes up pretty quick. Um, so where you're in a very similar ranging of that of the Rafal. Service ceiling of 50,000 feet, just a little under that of the Rafal, but really not too pressing of a uh, metric. Service life is anywhere from six to 10,000 hours, depending on which block you're looking at. Uh, cost per flight hour is about uh, just over $12,000 an hour, so actually pretty cheap by comparison. However, once again, this figure may be calculated totally different than how the French calculate their figures. It may just be just as expensive. However, they're mostly thanks to the U.S. Navy uh, are more of these in service, so kind of keep that in mind. Uh, it's, not as ex it's not as exported, but there's a lot of these in service, largely speaking, just because of the U.S. Navy. Then you have the uh, wing loading of about 94 pounds per square foot. A thrust-to-weight ratio is a little bit lower at 9 point, or 0.93. 
The APG 79A is a radar with an effective range of roughly 90 miles. Once again, not an exact figure, but gives us a general idea. Outpacing the Thales by a little bit, but not by a whole lot. Then you have two General Electric F414 GE 400 turbofan engines, 13,000 pounds of dry thrust each, with 22,000 pounds with afterburner. So it does have more thrust capability, but it's also about 10,000 pounds heavier. Now, the Block 3 does boast uh, more effective engines. I don't think it's a specifically different variant, um, and it doesn't specify how much faster it makes it. Um, we'll take a look more in a moment, but generally speaking, this is still roughly what you're looking at, even with the Block 3. So what are some of the pros of the Super Hornet? Well, this is a little bit more complex. The Block 2 Plus, which is something that the Kuwaitis are expecting but have ordered and exist at the moment, versus the Block 3, because there are differences. And as you'll see this banner here from Boeing India, it looks probably like they're going closer to the Block 3, which isn't hugely different from the Block 2, but it does have some changes we'll, we'll take a look at in a moment. But generally, we'll assume Block 3, we'll take a look at some of its systems that aren't as uh, well-marketed as the Thales Spectra. Uh, then it's cockpit, cockpit displays and controls. So let's look at Block 2 Plus first, because it's kind of important to know what the differences are. Largely speaking, Block 2 Plus is what the Kuwaitis are ordered. It doesn't have the conformally fuel tanks. It's not fully a Block 3. But uh, largely speaking, the only differences would really come down to uh, the displays, I think, are slightly different, but not a huge different. I believe they're still digital. Um, your engines are your kind of base 414s instead of any kind of upgraded or retooled versions, and you don't have conformal fuel tanks. But you still have the AESA radar. You still have all the advanced computing systems and navigation systems. You have the same defensive capability, same armament capability, same data link capability. You just don't have like the you don't have the premium leather seats basically is what the, this is. It's still the modern Super Hornet. It just doesn't have some of the bells and whistles that the Block Three does. This is what both, from my understanding, the Aussies I believe have maybe some Block Ones, but are largely rocking Block Two um, to Block Two Plus. The Kuwaitis have ordered Block Two Pluses that the U.S. Navy is currently in possession of that are working to transfer over. I'm not sure exactly how long that process takes, but those have been produced. They're out there. They're just not in the hands of the Kuwaitis yet. Um, and this might be something that India looks at because the pictures we've seen, despite Boeing India's very Block 3-looking conformal fuel tank having model here, the ones that they have been testing don't have the conformal fuel tanks. And we'll, we'll talk about it more in detail, but... The Super Hornet, while it works off of U.S. super carriers, uh, doesn't work off, I mean, hasn't been shown to operate off of ski jumps before this competition. This is something that the Super Hornet's been doing. So adding more weight is something that might be a bit of a problem. Yes, it may not be too big of an issue, but when you add those conformal fuel tanks, it's not nearly as easy to get them off as it is to remove wing stored fuel tanks is it more aerodynamically beneficial yes but it is not purely the exact same thing so what about the block three well the block three super hornet has a host of different improvements and this if i'm correct is a slide from uh the blowing blo boeing block three presentation that they had done with um the hx program in finland but the conformal fuel tanks of course add range Along with weight, they get you a little bit more without having to take up weapon stations uh, under the wings for external fuel storage. It has a slightly lower radar cross-section, largely thanks to those conformal fuel tanks. It has a more advanced cockpit system, so largely speaking, it's just the uh, ways the digital displays work. It is supposed to be able, from a kind of electronic warfare uh, digital system software standpoint to be a little bit easier to upgrade. Hard to really tell whether that whether or not that's true, but that's what they boast. 
You have the Block 2 IRST. This is a long range. Um, to counter stealth. So this is a very similar IS IRST system that we saw with the uh, Thales uh, OSF. Just a, <laughs> a little bit more powerful there. As you see, it's a, a massive pod on the underside of the Super Hornet. This is to kind of counter stealth. And with India, as far as a power problem, uh, you know, looking towards China, this might be beneficial for detecting like the J-20s, even though they're not like a huge force, they do exist. Um, then you have a more advanced kind of data link system as well um, between satellite communication as well as kind of your actual data linking between different aircraft and things. And as you see here, this has about 9,000 hour plus airframe uh, lifespan. So you're probably looking once again around the 10,000 hour mark. But what else does the Block 3 have? Well, but this is a lot of the same stuff. I just wanted to show it because I think it's cool. Um, you get a more specific note on how large those engines are or how much, how much fuel those conformal fuel tanks have, sorry. About 3,500 pounds each. So uh, you have 3,500 pounds in total. Uh, pretty beneficial, adds a lot of capability, much lower radar cross-section than that of the uh, wing-based or kind of centerline ones. Uh, it also reduces drag, so it does help the performance of the aircraft. While it weighs it down, it's not nearly as big of a problem if you're storing them under the wings of the fuselage. Uh, this helps with kind of the thrust. They've also been retooled from my understanding, but... Once again, I don't believe it's an entirely different engine. It's not a different variant. It's just kind of been um, tweaked, if you will. It's supposed to give more thrust, which is supposed to give more speed and acceleration. But largely speaking, I think that's really just to compensate for the external fuel tanks, or the conformal ones, um, <laughs> that effectively no one uses. I, we'll, we'll see. There's not a lot of countries that operate this, but generally speaking, most of them don't use this. Um... You have the advanced ASO radar, the same thing we looked at. You have the internal Iris T. I'm not exactly sure what this is referring to. Um, this could be something I tried to find, like a specific system, and I couldn't find something. This might be something that Boeing is working on. Um, and it also could be referring to that IRST pod on the bottom down there. Um, I don't know why they put internal, but, you know, who's to say? Then you have the enclosed weapon pod, which you don't see here, but uh, if you've looked at the Block 3 in Ace Combat, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's the kind of stealthy-looking pod that sits center line. Uh, personally, I think it looks kind of stupid. Um, but this helps reduce the radar cross-section of your munitions. It's stored in a separate pod that opens to fire them, so it reduces your radar cross-section. You're still not a stealth aircraft, but it is harder to tell you apart from some other things. Um, so survivability might be a little bit better there. It's also slightly less draggy, but not by like a huge margin, and you're actually adding a fair bit of weight to the aircraft. So kind of keep that in mind. It's an option. No one else really uses it. It may be a little different if it was kind of like the conformal fuel tanks and was kind of mounted into the wing where you didn't have the pylon, um, but still you're adding quite a bit of weight in messing with the aerodynamics of the aircraft. So the cockpit, you'll see a fair few more analog switches. Um, this is largely because the Block 1, um, and to an extent, the Block 2 didn't have a lot of the digital stuff that like, something like the Block 3 or the Rafal have. But you have this large single panel but three-sectioned display. It's multimodal, as you see all the buttons down there on the sides. So you can pretty much pull up anything you would have had in the Block 1 Super Hornet or the Legacy Hornet and still have all the same information. You do have a physical compass in there. appreciate that. Um, but this is kind of a mix, right? This isn't kind of as digitally focused as something like the Rafal is, but you have all kind of the same information and capability. This is kind of the more modernizing approach versus something that was kind of designed around this concept. I don't think it's really going to be a deal breaker on either side. It's just kind of nice to see what the inside of these aircraft look like. 
and what export deals exist. Uh, uh, Australia has 24 of these in service. Once again, I believe it's Block 2 to Block 2 Plus, maybe with some upgrade packages. Uh, they don't use conformal fuel tanks. Um, and then the Kuwaitis opted on the Block 2 Plus. So they have 20 of the, 28 of those technically still on order, but they've been produced. The U.S. Navy has them in their possession and is just waiting to do the transfer. And here we have an image of the ski ramp tests that the Super Hornet did. As you'll notice, nothing on any of the pylons, no conformal fuel tanks. This also could just be something that it maybe isn't the advanced Block 3 or whatever they want to call it, where it has the more retooled engines and the conformal fuel tanks, which can be removed. Those aren't necessarily something that is like hardwired into the aircraft. Uh, but it is some, it's interesting to note that from, my, from what I've seen picture-wise, there is not a picture of a Block 3 doing anything like this. So uh, pretty interesting. Just wanted to share that with you guys. So where are they going to operate from? Well, this is the INS Vikrant. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing that right. This is a ski jump carrier, so this does not have the catapult system that the U.S. or the Chinese Type 3 use, which is why the Super Hornet had to undergo those ski jump tests. This is one of the newer uh, carriers from a technical perspective, even without the catapult system. This is the first fully indigenous, if I'm correct, fully indigenous aircraft carrier that the Indians have built. Um, this is outside of the ski lift or the ski jump, rather, uh, very similarly shaped to like the Nimitz class. Uh, of course, the tower is a little different. It's kind of reshaped. It's supposed to be a little stealthier, even though you're not really going to hide an aircraft carrier. Um, this is what it looks like. This is pretty old because it takes a long time to build an aircraft carrier right and this is something the program for a new aircraft has been going on for a minute uh, but this is something kind of like the base information of the Vic Rint. uh it's pretty tall 59 meters not really too crazy by comparison 262 meters weight of 40,000 tons with a 62 meter has 14 decks it has um 34 Fixed wing and rotary aircraft. Not really sure if that's... This is something that we're, we'll talk about. Um, I guess now, technically, so now that I think about it, I don't really think I've got another so spot for it. Uh, the issue, which I, I talked about, I referenced earlier with the Super Hornet, uh, being about 10,000 pounds heavier than the Rafale, and by extension heavier than the MiG-29K. From some of the research I did, uh, at least one report showed... or estimated this wasn't from the indian navy so i'm not 100 percent sure on this uh the, the elevators that they use to get planes from the hangar deck to the flight deck uh were not strong enough to lift the super hornet because um, you know from an initial design standpoint it wasn't really intended to get a new aircraft uh but the indians decided they wanted to go for a new aircraft opened up the competition started doing their own kind of naval tages stuff and eventually have kind of whittled it down to Rafal and Super Hornet. But the Super Hornet's so much heavier that especially if you're looking at Block 3 with the conformal fuel tanks and maybe the weapons pods, which isn't something I've heard they're looking at, but um, it's hard to know without like existing presentations what's being offered, right? Uh, but even base level Super Hornet being 10,000 pounds heavier than that of the Rafal, they're going to have to retool some of the existing elevator um, supports and things to actually make sure that they could handle the uh, Super Hornet. And the Super Hornet is larger than the Royal Rafal from an like, actual standpoint. It's physically a larger aircraft, which means they couldn't have as many Super Hornets on the Vikrant. That is kind of a downside, but also kind of a good thing. It, it's When you have like one, two kind of like one and a half carriers because they do have another carrier. It's an older Russian uh, kind of modeled aircraft carrier. Um, I actually think it might have been Russian now that I think about it. But regardless, it uh, has the MiG-29Ks on it. It is kind of getting on in the years. The MiG-29Ks are not the most modern aircraft by any means. 
Um, so you kind of want to be able to power project as much as you can, and having more refalls would be beneficial. However, that also means that your fuel stores are going to be need, need to be replenished more often. And when you're largely looking at just kind of doing patrols, if it's in a war, it's a totally different situation. But the Indians aren't at war, and they're really not expecting to be at war with anyone anytime soon. So that's something that, on a patrol, you might actually get a little bit more leverage or longevity out of the Super Hornet. There's pros and cons to both, but generally I just wanted to bring that up. The, the Vicar might have to go into a little bit of a, a uh, maintenance period before Super Hornets can operate off of it effectively. But at least from what we've seen from the test and what the Indian Navy has said is both the Super Hornet and the Rafal can work off a ski jump. We already knew the Rafal could because it works off the Charles de Gaulle. But the Super Hornet can do it and has done it to a satisfactory degree that the Indians haven't disqualified it yet. So that's what they're operating off of. It's not really a huge deal, but it is something I wanted to mention. Now let's look at their existing fleet of MiG-29Ks, because this was something that, well, they largely kind of had intended to use on the Vikrin, but have decided to change what they're looking at. So they have 45 in service right now with their older aircraft carrier. The, oh, I am sorry to any of my Indian listeners out, listeners out there. The Vic Ram Adita, probably butchered that, but that is their other aircraft carrier that is, like I said, I'm pretty sure either if it's not Russian, it was built in cooperation with the Russians because it's a very Russian-style carrier. Um... Well, they have 45 in service. It's more than what they're looking at with either the Rafal or the Super Hornet, from my understanding, even though no like hard numbers have been given for either. The Vikrant doesn't look to be able to utilize that many um, on the aircraft carrier at once. These are not being replaced, though. This is something that is really just purely going to operate off the other aircraft carrier. There's not going to be any, in, any intermingling. Um... And, you know, normally I would say this is a little bit weird. Usually a country that's not producing its own aircraft wants to kind of stay within the realm of either one company or one country. But India's really just out there looking at everyone except the Chinese. Um, so, you know, parts, availability, building out of infrastructure, not something they really kind of shy away from. Uh, but yeah, they're not being replaced at the moment. They're just going to operate, operate off this older carrier. Um, they'll be retired in the future. Obviously this isn't something that they'll, um, you know, eventually transfer to the Vic rent or anything of that nature, but it does show an interesting sign that even with the previous refalls and now the, the refall and super Hornet and their continuing development of the Tejas, they're moving away from Russian aircraft and to an extent, uh, kind of the Chinese are as well. So it's very interesting to see kind of how the geo globe, I guess more the global aerospace industry is kind of working and how kind of some of the geopolitics uh, play into that. It's, there's just kind of an interesting thing I wanted to talk about the MiG 29 K. Then you have the Naval Tejas, which I'm, I've heard some conflicting reports that development is still continuing on this, but I've heard some reports saying that uh, the Navy is not, interested in a naval Tejas at this point. Uh, but you do see two tests there, uh, one alongside a MiG-29K and another one um, kind of operating off of what I believe to be a land-based ramp just for testing purposes. They have 32 Tejases in service with the Air Force. Any kind of indigenous test is usually, even if it doesn't work, there's still a lot of resources put into it, and there's a lot of hope um, that that's something that could work. Obviously, the more in-country business you're doing, the better for your economy, but also it's easier to source parts and make requests of any changes or anything you need. Um, so testing may still be going on, maybe just not as loudly, maybe not something that the Western world is going to be as pertinent to, but once again, I've heard conflicting reports, so take that with a grain of salt. It is single engine. They haven't explored a double engine Tejas. And generally speaking, save the F-35, most of the time, modern fighters 
operating off carriers do not want a single engine just out of redundancy's sake. Yes, you typically also will need the extra thrust to get off a ski ramp. Um, but generally speaking, it's nice to have a second engine in case one goes out. Because if you're over the ocean, you're not finding a place to land. You're going to have to land in the ocean unless you happen to be close to your carrier, which most of the time uh, is probably not going to happen because you're not patrolling in a tight circle around the carrier a lot. Uh, but yeah, so the indigenous development of this is something that's up in the air, but, uh, I still imagine even if it's canceled, there's still probably a lot of murmurings about what possibly could happen in the future with like a Mark II or any future variants of the Tages. So why does it matter? No one's talking about it, so it, it can't matter, right? Well, inside of India, obviously it's pretty important, but it matters from a power projection standpoint. Its actual capability, its interoperability, well, kind of important, isn't nearly as important as what it can do for the Indian power projection. In the region, their biggest single opponent, from a power projection standpoint, is China. The Indians aren't really pushing into the South China Sea or anything, but they're the other larger influence in the region. One of the things that the Indians have over the Chinese, largely speaking, is they have a much stronger naval presence in the Indian Ocean, as you'd expect, because, well, they're in the Indian Ocean. This is very important because they, largely speaking, have direct access to all of the trade networks from the Persian Gulf to China. The Persian Gulf supplies China with a lot of their fuel requirements. The Russians also do, but it's not like to the exact same extent. So having the ability to power project into those shipping lanes and say, China, you're doing something that's pissing us off because they have had some border skirmishes and stuff uh, in the last few years. If you know the option on the table is war, the Chinese are really being stubborn about it, which kind of seems like maybe the direction they're going in with how the... Uh, CCP has kind of reorganized itself uh, it's on the la- at the last part of Congress. Cutting those shipping lanes is a massive deal. I- as much as we think of China as the superpower, and I might do a separate video of talking about this because it's a very interesting concept or very interesting uh, topic of discussion, China imports a massive amount of most of the things it needs, whether that's food, whether it's fuel, Both of those are not something that China produces any large amount, domestically speaking. So if India say, you know, maybe China's doing something we don't like, maybe they're threatening an ally, maybe they're threatening us, let's see how you do without a few weeks of fuel. Because they don't store enough regularly for that to be a thing, which is why blackouts were starting to be a thing. And COVID played a part in that, obviously. But this is something that... If you're looking at a major naval component in power projection, this is largely where it's going to come into play. Now, of course, the Indians are going to want to power project into the other areas, whether it's Southeast Asia, whether it's kind of the Middle East or kind of the Horn of Africa. You have that capability with these more modern fighter craft, this more capable aircraft carrier, and being able to operate with France or the U.S. makes a huge difference. So largely speaking, it depends on which way the Indians want to do the political calculus of are we turning our attention more towards the Persian Gulf, more kind of towards Pakistan in terms of maybe a combatant force, trying to project our influence into the coastal African countries, or are we going to turn our attention more towards Southeast Asia? Um, It's not obviously going to be a sole deciding factor, but it is something that probably goes into the political calculus there. It increases their blue water capability. This is something that, once again, goes along with power projection, but uh, but it is something that not a lot of countries really have this capability, right? Yes, the French have uh, one aircraft carrier, from my understanding. I think maybe a second one's in production. But the Charles de Gaulle is their main power projecting force. The British have two. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth classes, I think is the the class of those ships there's two of them on operation the chinese have two three technically aircraft carriers um then the u.s of course has our supercarrier fleets uh then you have some countries that are operating 
a like smaller fleet of possible escort carriers, kind of like the Japanese are toying with at the moment. Um, but generally speaking, this puts India in a very small club of people that can really push uh, out into the deep blue, right? A lot of countries that have navies usually are focusing them around coastal or small regional areas, oddly enough, like the Chinese. Um, but not a lot of, you know, like, France, the U.S., the British, those are largely the main ones that are really sending these larger ships or these kind of small fleets out into areas that they really wouldn't be expected to operate out of. Um, and then we kind of just go full circle back here to what I talked was talking about at the moment of countering China into the Indian Ocean. While the Chinese don't have a lot of capability to reach out that far, if they want to try to protect some shipping lanes, if that ever becomes a problem, this is something that would be a huge counter to the fairly small force that the Chinese will probably send to the Indian Ocean because a lot of their ships are not uh, uh, blue water capable. So let's take a look at some of the special credits here. Uh, the INS Victory Commission, Dassault Rafal versus Boeing, Super Hornet, which fighter jet will India pick? This is from Z News, uh, who I believe Arjit Gurg, Garg uh, had written. We also have from anynews.in, which I'm almost positive is nan not an anime news uh, website, the Indian Navy evaluating trial reports of Rafal and F-18 for uh, USD 5 billion fighter jet deal. Competition heats up for naval fighter deal ahead of Vikram's commissioning. This is the Hinduistan Times from Rahul uh, Sai Singh. Something like that. And then, of course, the specifications from the wiki. So... Uh, these are a couple of places if you want to look for some information on this, you can. Um, this is still ongoing, so there's not a conclusive answer. Kind of take that as you will. As I said at the top, not a lot of people, especially on YouTube, are really making videos about this because well, it's not been done. And for the most part, you know, India is not uh, a is not from a geopolitical standpoint a country the West talks about a lot unless, like, a specific problem comes up. So I thought it'd be nice to shine some light. It's a very interesting competition from my perspective, and I wanted to talk about it. So what am I working on next? Well, the next video definitively is going to be New Zealand's Grippins, the case for the Grippin for New Zealand as they look to kind of rebuild their air force. You've got uh, the next one after that will be Ukraine's next main battle tank. Um, this may change. That one may change a little bit depending on how the continued Kherson offensive goes, uh, as the Russians are pulling out of the Kherson um, uh, Western Bank at the moment. And then eventually the case against the F-16, and why I think the Ukrainian Viper may not be the best solution. Anyway, let me know in the comments down below if there's something else you'd like me to ramble on about in the near future, and I will uh, see y'all in the next one.